spoken, some people uh, filtered it. Um, but we have Dan with us. Uh, Dan, I think you came last year for the first time? I did. And uh, he's back again. Like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of first timers don't come back. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> last year, you guys basically paid for my entire trip in alcohol, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Trevor's always moved for some booze. Uh, I did bring a cooler full of uh, beer. It's around here somewhere. Um, so we'll have that for us uh, later tonight, tomorrow, and during the day, or all the other times when people drink alcohol here. Um, Robert, I think you're good to go. Robert's thumbs up. And then Chris is fixing the tablecloth. Thank you. His battery's quite dying. Um, yeah, I think we're ready to go ahead and, and uh, get kicking here. Um, Dan was here last year talking about his Amiga game and work. Um, and it is freaking amazing. I can't wait to see what the year has, has given for us. Uh, Dan, take it away. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Salvato. I'm a professional game designer um, and a lifelong classic Amiga fanboy. <laughs> yeah, it's been a lifelong dream of mine to make a game for Amiga. And now that I have the skills of finally making it happen. After five. And this runs on stock Amiga 500 with the trapdoor expansion. Um, should work on the 1000 as well, as long as you have a little extra memory. You just need an extra 512k of uh, fast memory or what have you. Um, I feel like I would be betraying my childhood self if it didn't run on a 1000 because that's what I grew up with. It was my family's computer. I was enthralled by it as a kid. They eventually packed it up um, once they got a Windows 95 machine. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I kept bugging, bugging my dad to pull it back out of storage. You know, was, you know, even for some reason, even as a kid, I wasn't old enough to know what retro was, but I still had, uh, you know, a, a thing for retro hardware. And Amiga was just—it has such a unique personality to it. Classic Amiga, just the way the hardware is designed, and that's something you know, as a gaming enthusiast. Um, something that I picked up on. It's like every classic gaming system sort of has its own personality. And Amiga is especially unique. And in the modern landscape of games and people's love for retro games, um, Amiga gets very little love. Um, you know, mostly because the, the most influential games were typically on, you know, like NES and Super Nintendo and all that with the Japanese developers really breaking ground in game design. Um, so we're not seeing Amiga's unique personality captured quite as much in modern day uh, when people look back on retro games. Um, so I wanted to not just make a game for Amiga, but make a game that Amiga is the, is the best platform to make this game happen. So I thought about how can I utilize the Amiga's hardware capabilities, bit planes, uh, and sprites, and, and collision in unique ways, um, and even audio in some ways, in order to make a unique experience. And this is the, uh, the game that I came up with. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to pick up. This is a pretty gradually paced demo uh, because I designed it to be playable here on the show floor. You can give it a shot uh, at any point this weekend. Um, but it's sort of like a precision platformer game. Um, you have this little character here. She gets a jump and she can jump twice in the air. Um, and she also has a shot, which will come to play a little bit later. I'll, I'll take one hit here on purpose just so you can see what it looks like. Ooh, that was awesome. Uh, uh, yeah. So, you know, you know as, as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a uh, game designer by profession, and it's, uh, you know, it's really interesting not just having this come to life. I see it on other platforms as well. There's a lot of, um, a lot of people making really fantastic quality modern games for retro systems, and seeing those modern design sensibilities. Uh, Breathing new life into these old systems is something that's really incredible and fascinates me, and it's something that I'm, uh, you know, proud and grateful to be able to be a part of. Did you say that Cave Story is perhaps one of your inspirations? It's not getting um, by. Yeah. Okay, um, I played a little bit of Cave Story, but um, I wouldn't call myself a, like a, you know, a diehard fan of the game or anything like that. It was a very cool game for the time, though. Um, and it could be that maybe indirectly because Cave Story clearly inspired a lot of other modern indie games that may have inspired me. 
you know, because that was very influential for its time. That was like a 2004 game or something like that. Way, yeah, a couple, yeah, way ahead of its time um, in, the, in the indie space. And now we're seeing all kinds of indie games that have this sort of, you know, capturing a retro pixel art aesthetic. Um, you know, but I'm always thinking, why are we mimicking the aesthetic when we can, you know, actually develop for the retro hardware? We have the, you know, more tools and knowledge available than ever before to do this. Uh, we can make better experiences on this hardware than they've ever been able to before, uh, thanks to these modern tools. Um, and so, so that's where I am. I don't want to imitate. I want to. I want to do the real thing. Oh, that's cheating. <laughs> What's? <laughs> I made the game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can, you, know, you can try it and tell me it's cheating after you try it. I mean, it's kind of like, um, I think the experience you might have with this is I'm thinking like a, like a boardwalk game or a carnival game, you know, like the toss the ball in the bucket sort of thing, it always bounces out. Um, but you know it's possible, and you can kind of know that you know there's a trick to it, you know what I mean? And it just, it entices you to keep going, because you're like, I gotta find the trick, you know, I gotta, I gotta make it work. And that's sort of the drive that you have with this sort of game. It's, it's very punishing, you're going to, you know, take deaths over and over and over, you have to try a hundred times before you do it. But, um, when you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, it's, it becomes a game of perseverance, and it's extremely rewarding when you, when you actually make it through. So that's the sort of game design that I'm going for with this game. Uh, that was true. <laughs> Do you have collision detection on the top of the bars, or just the like? Can you go through up through it, or you have to go all the way around it? Uh, the thin ones, you can go through them. So you can see at the top of the screen here. There's a there's a platform that I can go through like that. <laughs> And then the the um, the red components, like the spikes and all that, um, that is. I mean, I'm not going to get too much into the technical side of things. Uh, you know, maybe afterwards if we have a technical technical audience. But that's effectively pixel perfect collision with uh, with the spikes and all of that. Um, it's you know it's literally just drawn with a with a bitmap and using you know Amiga's really excellent collision detection. I can do pixel perfect collision on those. Uh, and it feels really great for a precision platform like this. And you'll see that come into play to a little bit of a greater effect once we uh, jump into the boss here. So we make we make it out of this area. No USB connected. Is the third character a sprite? Yeah. Did you have help with the art, or is this your art as well? Uh, I I don't do the art. That's kind of the one thing that I don't do. I think 
um, if you look at the landscape of classic Amiga games from back in the day, um, not a lot of them have, you know, a lot of them are more arcade style games, they don't go for more of a deep narrative, unless it's like, unless it's like a text-based adventure, then it might have a deep narrative, but um, it is, it's very popular nowadays, um, you know, in the indie space to,
game is going to have some branching paths as well. You know, you can sort of uh, choose where you want to go next as part of your adventure, and it's going to change the way that the story unfolds. This is uh, the dialogue is a little different depending on how well you do during the fight. So she says it's a piece of cake. 
Um, but if you try this, you're probably not going to get the same dialogue. <laughs>
were you saying about getting dark? I had just a reminder that one death is the one I took on purpose at the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's a little bit of dark twist at the end of the demo, but it's, it's more about, you know, it, it's, not, it's not happening halfway through the game. It's, it's not like, a, um, you know, not giving the finger to the player or anything like that. It's, it, it's more to set the stage, set the tone of the game, you know? Um, there's sort of this helper character that's um, introduced sort of as a tutorial, and, and she's like a friend who's going to help you on your journey. And then when this happens at the end of the chapter, that that uh, puts you in, in the mindset that this is going to be a, a lonely journey for the main character, Nova. You know, she's going to be on her own, she's going to be scared, and um, she's not going to have the confidence booster that was offered to her at the beginning here. Um, so that's, that's really the, the purpose of the, the narrative arc in that first chapter, is, is to get that feeling across to the player. You know? Having that emotional resonance, as I was talking about, is uh, really important for uh, becoming attached to the characters in the game. Um, yeah, so uh, the cool thing is, I spent all of my time working on this demo, uh, up until this morning, I would say, and um, didn't prepare anything else for this talk. <laughs> so, so yeah, this is what we got. Um, as I mentioned, I'm happy to, to jump into technical stuff, um, if you would like, um, in general. You know, we could just have a conversation if you want to ask questions about, um, you know, my own experience as a gamer game developer or a Amiga enthusiast, or you want to know more about uh, the game engine, the demo. I'm happy to uh, jump into whatever you want to talk about. I have my uh, developer environment set up here as well. Um, again, if you wanted to take a look at that. But yeah, it's, you know, happy to just give it an open floor at this point. You know, whatever you want to hear about, I can get into. Now, that was running on, the, on a, or a PC or a Mac? Uh, yeah, this is a Mac. I'm just running a UAE. Oh, so you're running on the UAE? Yeah, okay. yeah. My entire dev environment is, is fully modern. I use, I use all modern tools. Um, the, uh, the build tools are um, partially like cross-platform assemblers that have been developed by others and uh, a lot of my own scripts and, and utilities that I wrote myself to sort of tie everything together and compile, uh, compile the data. You know, I'm, I'm giving it um, things like PNGs and WAV files and specifying how I want to construct them together into a level file and they just go through my scripts basically and, and you know, it turns out the correct data structures. Is the engine uh, built specifically for this game, or have you built it so you can use it for other types of games? The engine is built specifically for this game, and it was definitely required in order to get this kind of performance. The more generalized you get with the engine, um, usually the less performant it's going to be, you know, because you have to design it for a million use cases instead of just one, you know? This is something where I designed it for the one purpose of drawing as many bullets on the screen as I can at 60 frames per second. However, um, the engine is designed to be extremely modular. So aside from the base code of the game, everything in the level, all of the rooms, you know, the hazards, the attack patterns, uh, like the dialogue scripting, the graphical assets, the music and the sound, they are all contained in a level file. So. Uh, what people would actually be able to do is they could take the base game and as long as they have the correct uh, documentation and, and an understanding of the code base, uh, they can create their own level file and just uh, stick it into the game directory and, and play their own custom level. And these, uh, these level files, I mean, you can put code in them as well. And so, you know, if you're executing arbitrary code, you can do literally whatever you want. You know, you can make your own game in this game if, if uh, you have the know-how and you're familiar with the engine. So the door is going to be wide open uh, for those use cases. And you know, if the game takes off, I would really, really love to uh, see what people might be able to do with that. And we're thinking about um, open sourcing some of the tools in the engine in order to make that possible. Are the animations, like the one at the end, for example, is it like a single plane anim or anim-like compression? Or is it a vector? Um, so uh, I assume you're talking about the animation with the like the eagle shadow oh, right, thing. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's all code. Ooh. So I have, um, yeah, it, it's all just uh, glitter objects. It's all bobs, you know. Uh, she was made of the, the head was 
uh, the head was kind of a one bit plane blob that was just animated, and the rest was just circle graphics. And I just put like a hundred circle graphics and coded them to sort of flow in that, in that uh, style. And, and that's, yeah, that's how a lot of the uh, graphics and attacks are going to be designed in this game, is, is through code like that. Um, that attacks layer is one bit plane, and that's a big secret on how this, uh, this uh, game is so performant because I need to fully clear and redraw that screen every single frame. Um, and it's thanks to Amiga's bit plane system that that's possible to do at that speed. Um, I was talking about how Amiga inspired this game, and, and that's a big part of it, thinking about how it can leverage bit planes in a really unique way. Because if you look at um, you know, the older catalog of Amiga games, um, you know, everyone seemed to be really excited about 16-bit, right? Uh, it, was, it was at the forefront of that. It was, uh, you know, it was a leader in, 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 the, in the bit wars, you could say. You know, this 16-bit uh, games machine with this, you know, incredible color palette of graphics and, and, and the, uh, the full digitized sound and all of that. And I think a lot of game developers prioritized that and made these big colorful sprites uh, as part of their game. Effectively, they wanted to do chunky graphics, but Amiga does bit planes, you know? And because of that, it kind of becomes a mess because you're... You're blending the character on top of the background, and then uh, there's like a lot of weird oddities with the bit planes. It's like even and odd bit planes are different. You have to, you know, you could do dual play field mode, but then you have fewer colors. Um, you probably have to like when you clear the the character, you have to like redraw the background on top of it. So there are all these weird sacrifices that had to be made um, for for those those big colorful graphics. But they looked really good in, in magazines, right? And that's probably another big reason why. Because if you could say, hey, I have like an arcade, like true arcade graphics, you know, on the Amiga, then your game is probably going to sell. But it's not going to lead to great performance, and it's not going to lead to great gameplay. Uh, but, you know, we have a lot of hindsight, and the landscape is different now, and we can do whatever we want with the machine. And also, I don't have a deadline. I can spend two years on a game engine, and I don't have, you know, a publisher knocking at, knocking at my door to get this game shipped. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I can, I can um, leverage these unique capabilities in really, really interesting ways, and that's, that's part of what makes this project so fun. What are the games you have planned? Hmm. Um, this is the only Amiga game that I'm working on, and since this is an Amiga convention, that's all you need to hear about. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Good for you. Yeah. If you... So, so okay. commercially, like... What is your expectation? How do you think that's going to work with, with this title? Yeah, that's, that's another really interesting component here, right? Because uh, I would say, uh, you know, first of all, this game will be released for Amiga, you know? Um, ideally, I can find a, uh, a distributor who wants to do a, a box set with floppies, you know? Um, we've seen, uh, what was it, Roguecraft recently that got a, bo a box release? Yeah, in incredible. I love that uh, companies are interested in doing this, you know? Because it's, it's, it's such a cool thing to do. Uh, and even if, uh, even if it's not the most profitable venture for the distributor, it still looks really great. And I think it is a great reputation. It was for everybody involved, right? The developer, the, uh, the distributor, um, and then the fans are happy. So that's really excellent. But... Uh, this game is, I would say, you know, just based on, based on my following, I would estimate that about one in a thousand people who play this game have heard of Amiga. Not have used one, but have heard of one. One in a thousand. So, uh, so every, all of the design principles that are going into this game uh, in some cases are kind of anti-classic Amiga, right? Uh, the game is in 16 by 9, um, it's square pixels, it's NTSC, which, you know, all the Amiga games are PAL. Uh, but that's because what I'm optimizing for here is really a Steam release on, on PC uh, and other platforms because that is where 99.99% of the players are going to be playing it. And that's what I want to be the optimal experience. And in my opinion, that's not going to take away from the experience of Amiga fans, because putting in a floppy and having this game run on Amiga in general uh, is going to be incredible in itself. It's going to be really novel to play this game on real hardware, um, and that's going to elevate the experience for, for Amiga fans who want to play it in that way. Uh, and so I'm really happy to um, optimize the experience for uh, modern platforms in this way, to be in line with what modern games uh, expect uh, in their games. 
So that's a little bit on the release strategy of this game. I can't give you like a numbers prediction on, on how this might perform, and that you know would partially depend on the quality of the final game, which uh, remains to be seen. Um, but I would say that um, even if the game had a small following, um, I would be really thrilled and happy. As I mentioned, this is it's been a lifelong dream of mine to, to make a game like this, and just to see any reception at all, to see some people like it, is, is going to mean the world to me. Um, can you walk through a little bit of, of your dev environment? And I'm particularly interested in what the original Commodore, we have some Commodore folks here, uh, what yeah. they think of a modern development tool against their their brainchild uh, from so many years ago. We do have some people in the room, and I'd like to uh, like to see their take on your modern uh, dev. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to walk through some stuff. Let me uh, let me let me see. So of course I have this running in an emulator here, and I can't show absolutely everything, but um, I can show you some of the important stuff. Um, and my, my environment's a little bit unconventional. I use Vim for my actual text editing. Um, but there are amazing setups people have in, in VS Code for this sort of thing. You know, there's Amiga development extensions for VS Code that set up the dev environment for you. Um, but for the purpose of being able to iterate as rapidly as possible, um, I set up a lot of my own amenities as well. Um, you know, typically with software, uh, especially games, the faster you can iterate on things, the better a game you can make. And so um, when I want to build, my game, I just hit a hotkey, and in about one second, I'm in and testing my changes, just like that. Um, and you know, there's a lot of work to make that happen. First of all, I'm, you know, I'm assembling an, an Amiga game on a computer that's probably a hundred thousand times faster than an Amiga, so that helps. Um, but the emulator environment works really uh, works works really well for this. I think. Last year when I showed this off, I was building and the emulator was booting up every time. I further optimized this, and I actually just have the emulator running in the background. I have a save state just on the, um, on the DOS screen here. And when I hit build, um, I run a script on my Mac after the game builds. It puts the window in focus, uh, hits enter in the DOS screen, and then enters um, warp mode for about half a second in the emulator <coughs> to put myself right in the game. And that's just a script, you know, that that I wrote uh, for for the Mac. It's, it's a piece of cake to uh, to write those sorts of things with uh, with Apple Script, um, but that's that's a small optimization that ends up making a huge improvement. Um, and we get debugging tools as well. You know, I can uh, let me see if it happens to be set up. Um, but yeah, let me just jump into a file here and go to like a. Um, the initialize function and then you know start the debugger and I use this quite a bit. It's, it's amazing that someone uh, wrote a, a plugin to make this possible in Vim and you can do this in VS Code as well. Um, VS Code's built-in debugging tools. Uh, the extension includes support for them. Um, so we jump in here and yeah it's effectively a full debug environment. I can step through the code. I can uh, view all the registers. Um, I can you know I can view and modify memory. Uh, it's, it's pretty much everything you would expect out of a, a dev environment, and there are a couple of quirks here and there, but uh, you know. Set breakpoints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I had one set right here. This is uh, what I jumped into. Is uh, this, this sort of uh, entry point? But yeah, I can set arbitrary breakpoints. Um, I don't think I can do memory breakpoints. That is um, the the debug environment for Amiga emulators is a little bit strange because. I think um, WinUAE has great built-in debugging tools, but in order to do remote debugging, um, at least uh, FSUAE, WinUAE might have it now, but FSUAE the, for cross-platform uh, doesn't have remote debugging built-in, and so there's people who have forked it and had their, added their own remote debugging support, and that's kind of what I have going on. So there are a couple of quirks here and there, um, but it's, it's actually amazing how effective it, it is, um, and I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this. Um, especially during the production of this demo. So um, that is, um, yeah, that's an example of what it's like to actually build and, and test and iterate on this game. Um, and then in terms of putting together the level files, um, I have a, uh, well, I didn't think about it.
about it, but I can like make the text a little bit bigger here. Um, yeah, I have a, a TOML file, which is just a, a markup language like YAML or XML or something like that, um, that effectively just specifies all the information that the level needs, you know? Um, so I can give it uh, uh, event systems, I can give it attacks, uh, bobs, and scripts, and you know, backgrounds, and, and other graphics. Here's all the sound effects where I just say the sample rate and the volume and, and all of that. Um, here's room definitions, every single room that I was traversing through. Um, it has a hazards image, which is all the spikes and things like that. Um, there's the... Did you write a validator to, to make sure there's uh, or, or objects like conflict or... Um, you might be missing something from, from your... Uh, uh, yeah, so, so the cool thing is this system that I'm showing you is not specialized for my game. Um, I wrote a, a generalized piece of software called Simple Binary Builder, and you can, um, uh, and it's open source, it's on GitHub, you can use it to create your own data structures. And so based on what you're doing, um, you can very quickly and easily create your own validation uh, for the types of um, the types of data structures that you're making. So, um, for example, um, let's see, this is one I actually had to do while working on the demo because I caught it a strange case where when defining sprite animations, um, let's see if I can go to a place where that's relevant. So, yeah, here's some sprite animations and for each animation I have uh, for example, a, a list of all the different sprite IDs that make up the animation, and then a list of frame times, you know? So it's like, this sprite lasts for four frames, this one lasts for five. They're usually all the same frame times for like a smoothly animated sprite, but sometimes you want it to pause a little bit or go faster depending on the motion. Um, yeah, and these two tables, of course, need to have the same number of entries in them, you know? Because uh, each sprite ID needs, you know, its own frame time. Um, but I actually ran into a case where they were not the same. And I didn't have validation for that, and it was, you know, kind of screwed me over for a little bit. So as soon as I caught that, I just, yeah, threw in, um, threw in my validation for it. Um, yeah, here's the data structure for animations, and uh, down here, uh, where the frame times are specified, it just, you know, compares that to the length of the sprite IDs and throws an error if, uh, if they're not equal. And so your simple binary loader, did you call it? Uh, builder. Builder. Um, you're using it to build out a game, right? Um, no, I built it for this game specifically. Oh, just for this one. Yeah, but I realized it would be a, just a really great generalized tool. Because I built it because I couldn't find the tool that I needed. Of course. Yeah, and so I'm like, okay, well, that probably means other people could use something like this. Especially people in the retro game development scene, you know? Where you kind of need to build all of your own custom data structures because, you know, you can't just throw a bunch of PNGs into Unity Game Engine and call it a day. Oh, you know? right, right. No. What yeah. I was getting at was, were you going to leverage what you learned from this and when you're building your other games? You? Yeah. Um, that, that is a good question. And I think it comes down to determining what the right tools are for the job. Because sometimes the inefficient way is the way to go, you know? Yeah. Um, the generalized, bulky, um, poor performance game engine, we don't like them, but um, in a number of cases, honestly, it leads to making better games. And the reason is that you don't have to spend all this time building your own tools and getting into the nitty gritty. All of that time, which in this case took me hundreds and hundreds of hours to build this game engine, could have gone straight to game design, you know? Yeah. And so, so now I'm releasing a game where, you know, I put, I don't know, let's just say a thousand hours in the game engine and then a thousand hours in game design. Well, maybe I could have gone 100 hours in the game engine and 1,900 hours into game design, and maybe that would have resulted in a better game. And that's really what these uh, less efficient modern generalized tools uh, afford us. And so it really comes down to just um, deciding what's going to make the better game in the end. Did you take any professional training to do your game designs? I, mean, I done... did not. <laughs> so this is all your own, your own love of work and, and learn as you go and... Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's self-taught, and I think that um, where that comes from is, you know, there's these communities, the Amiga community is one example, of course, but other gaming communities as well, just as I grew up, I was so passionate about this game and the community I was a part of, it meant so much to me that I wanted to contribute to it, you know? Um, I 
have these emotional experiences um, playing in games and being part of these communities and that inspire me to want to provide that to others, you know? Sure. I think through through this sort of creative work, it's almost a form of communication, you know? I'm I'm taking everything that all the emotions that I took in and I'm, I'm delivering it to other people to give them a, a similar experience. And that really drove me to learn what I needed to learn in order to get these things done. It was a slow process, of course. It was one step at a time um, until we've reached a culmination that, that we're seeing uh, here, for example. But I think that sort of doing by learning, just bit by bit, is, uh, is, is really the way to go. And, and um, you can, and, and that can't be captured through taking classes, for example. You know, you just, you have to channel your passion. So let's um, wrap up. That's okay. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. Dan will be here all weekend. He's got a table. Yeah, yeah. Please Where's talk to me. I'd love to show off more. Um, you can try out my game. You know, um, I would, I would love to watch you try my game. <laughs> um, that'll be fun for me. Um, it'll make for good playtesting as well. You know, because people, a whole variety of skill levels are going to be playing this game. And so, you know, I'll be, I'll be taking mental notes on, on everyone's performance, and I'd be really grateful to just talk about it and, and share everything I'm doing. You know, I'm really grateful that you had me here as well. Um, yeah, I, I love you guys. Thanks for your interest.